When I look out into the world, I see people trying to, to find life in the things around them, whether it be their, their job, their spouse, their kids, their accomplishments, uh, adventurous things, their hobbies, sexual things, sometimes even illegal things. Uh, I see them trying to, to, to find life, to, to fill a deep soul need, uh, to, to have life and to have it to the full. You see, when we, through Adam, rebelled and chose our independence, we didn't realize, but we were enslaving ourselves to sin. And when we do that, now everything, all major decisions we have to make are from the perspective of sin. And so when you take any major issue in the world today, uh, marriage, family, uh, sexuality, race, poverty, we thereby have to address all of those issues from the perspective of sin. As I look at some of the horrific things that happen uh, around the world in our nation, I think of Las Vegas, and the uh, media always points and tries to blame guns and security, motives, when the real issue is the heart of people. They have a heart of sin, and the heart needs to be changed if there's going to be a change in people or in our culture. I think the gospel again is the greatest news. Jesus is at the center of the gospel. He's the one that he's the one that has done the work. Uh, he's done a complete work on the cross, paid for our sins. He did a complete work when he resurrected from the grave uh, and gave us new life with him. New life. The old life is gone. The new life has come. It's a regenerative life. It's a it's a new life. Um, and so we're going to walk in His strength, uh, by His power, for His glory, um, in His strength. The gospel is the only thing that can truly bring peace, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Uh, and as John 10.10 10 says, uh, we have life, and not only life, but life to the full. In Jeremiah 2, God says, uh, You have forsaken me, God, the fountain of living water, to hew for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns which can't, can't hold water. And that's what these things that people try to find life in are, broken cisterns that will never satisfy their, their soul's desire for life. But what the gospel does is it attaches us to God, the, the fountain of living water, the one that won't run dry. Uh, and it frees us to not try to be selfish and trying to find life in uh, the things or the people around us, uh, but it frees us to, to love others. The Bible also says uh, we love because he first loved us. And we are, when we are connected to God, the fountain of living water, we can be a source of life and love in the world. And that's why the gospel is uh, the answer to the world's problems. And I can't help but think of 2 Timothy 3, where Paul was writing to Timothy, said, And that from childhood you've known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It's in this book <laughs> that the message of the gospel, faith in Jesus, is revealed to us. And you know what, guys? I, what, what a, I got to tell you, parents, I was so blessed listening to those blessings you did this morning. You know, guys, they were so full of God's word and God's truth and God's heart for your children. I was just praying along with you as you were reading those blessings to your children and praying them. And I would preach from one knee if I could get back up like some of these brothers did, but I'm afraid it'd take me too long to get back up. But I appreciate that because you know what? You got down right in the face of your children and spoke to them heart to heart and in the presence of God. So thank you so much. But you know what? It wasn't always possible to put a Bible in the hands of a child. Matter of fact, it wasn't possible to put the Bible in the hands of anyone. But it's actually the Reformation... It's there where we find the roots where the ability for us to have a Bible in our hands, in our own language, is a part of our everyday life. See, before the Reformation, the Bible was literally chained to the pulpit. I'm talking about literally. The Bible, the book, chains to the pulpit so nobody could take it. 
Uh, first of all, the Bibles were very expensive that, at that time. They weren't easy to come by. Uh, they were uh, in Latin, so only really those that had a, a scholar ability could understand it. And there was a feeling that the common people were not able to interpret the book properly themselves. And so it was left to the clergy to interpret the Bible for them, and they felt it'd be dangerous just to put this book in the hands of everyday people because they were afraid they'd misuse it. But Martin Luther said this. This is what he believed, that a simple layman armed with the scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Those are strong words. <laughs> That's what Martin Luther believed. The common layman, armed with a scripture, is more mightier than the mightiest pope without it. And because Martin was a, uh, a priest, part of the clergy, he had access to the Bible. And when he started to study the scriptures, and again, because he was scholarly, and at that time, the, the Greek New Testament by Erasmus had come out not long before that first time in nearly a thousand years, and anything like this was in the hands of the scholars. They had the Latin Vulgate that was the common book of the church. And, and as Luther started to study these two, he started to recognize that things that he had been taught by the church as a priest were not consistent with what this book was saying. And furthermore, he saw that there were many things that were added by the church, all kinds of doctrines, all kinds of practices, all kinds of rituals, all kinds of sacraments and ceremonies that went beyond what the scripture said. And it was out of this experience that this whole major doctrine of the Reformation called script... Uh, script Sola Scriptura. That's what I get for trying to be like Dan and speak in another language from the pulpit. I just can't do it. Scripture alone, I can do that one. <laughs> That's where the doctrine came from. It all was formed in this furnace of real life and struggle that Martin Luther had with looking at this book and looking at what had been taught by the church and seeing a conflict between the two. And this is what sola scriptura means. The Bible is the final and only infallible authority for faith and practice. Now, infallible means this. It's not even capable of making a mistake. <laughs> and so, and the word only is key because at that time, there was more than just the Bible. They looked to the traditions of the church. They looked to the official teachings of the church. They looked to the Pope as also having authority. But Martin Luther's struggle was the fact that the Bible is the only and the infallible authority that speaks for God regarding life and faith. And thus, sola scriptura came out of the Reformation now, let me tell you, it's an interesting story of how this came about. We learned last week from Dan, uh, the 95 Thesis was posted by Martin Luther on the church in Wittenberg. And the heart of those indulgences, or I'm sorry, the heart of those theses was an attack against the indulgences of the church. But if you ever read through it, there were many statements about the Pope and his position as well. Now, what this did is this caused a rift between Martin Luther and the Pope as the Pope saw this. Matter of fact, they had such a relationship that the Pope called Martin Luther a wild boar in the vineyard, and Martin Luther called the Pope the Antichrist. This was their relationship with one another. So you got a feel of where there was. So there was a big rift. Because what happened here is a switch went on from indulgences that Martin Luther's attack now was upon papal authority. Does the Pope have to be obeyed in what he says? And so the real question that came out at this time was this. Who has authority to speak for the church? Therefore, really, 
who has authority to speak for God? And it was in this context that the conflict grew. And so the Council of Cardinals in 1520 had called Martin Luther to come to Rome to explain himself as to all these teachings and things that have been coming from him. And Martin didn't go, but instead he returned with writing two of the most inflammatory documents he wrote in his, this entire time of the Reformation. And the first one was called a uh, open letter to the Christian nobility of the German nation. Don't you love those seeker-friendly titles they used at that time? But basically, he was urging the nobility and the princes, princes and uh, leaders in Germany to reject the authority of the Church of Rome over them. He used uh, Romans 15 with the idea that submit to the government authority. So he was writing an open letter and saying, you guys don't have to listen to what Rome is saying. Reject it. And then he wrote another one later that same year was called the, Bap the Babylonian Captivity of the Church. And this was about the fact that captivity, bondage, you know, slavery, he felt that the Catholic Church was keeping people in bondage through the sacrament system. And he rejected all the sacraments except for two of them, the two you find in the New Testament, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Well, following the publishing of these tracts, now Luther was commanded, to, uh, not just asked to come, explain yourself in Rome, but now he's commanded to come before the imperial diet of worms or worms. Now, that's stuff we don't think of, you know, uh, we're not talking about a diet of worms, you know, eating worms. Worms was the name of a city, properly pronounced Worms in German. And the imperial diet was like the legislative body at that time, the princes, the nobility, the, the, boy, I'm really struggling this morning. Nobility, slow down, Pat. Take your time, relax, breathe. No more mistakes so you can sit back and relax. But also, you know, the emperor was there as well. So here he was, he was called to this imperial diet before the legislative body of Rome. What they did at that time is the diet that meant the gathering of the legislative body would move from town to town throughout the Roman Empire. This time it was in Worms. So it was the diet of Worms that he was called to. And uh, the reason for this is because, you know, what Luther was doing was creating trouble, not just within the church, but within the nation. This became a political problem as well as a religious problem. And so he was called there and commanded to come in front of this diet and as Luther went, there were two things that he went. First of all, he went assuming he was going to die and be killed there. He didn't believe he'd come back home. But second of all, he thought there's a chance to debate here. And that I'm going to get a chance to explain myself and my teachings in front of a group of people. When Martin entered the town, there were 2,000 cheering people that welcomed him as he walked into town. So this became a gigantic obstacle and when he walked in the next day into the, in front of the diet, expecting to debate, basically there were two questions that Martin was asked. The first one is they pointed at a pile of books that were sitting over on a table and said, Martin, are these your books? And he said, yes, they are. The second thing they said is, will you recant of the things that are inside this book? Now in this dialogue on this first day, Something interesting happened. The Archbishop, uh, John Eck, was representing the Catholic Church. John Eck was an expert in church tradition and church history. Martin Luther, while he knew church history and tradition, his expertise was the area of the Bible. And so during this argument, John Eck presented one question to Martin that knocked him back in his seat. And it made him stop and think. And this was the question. I think we have it on a PowerPoint, Pete. Thank you. If Luther was right, did that mean for 1,000 years or more, God had abandoned his church, 
his people and his bride to deception and error? Was it really possible, Luther, uh, that pretty much you're the only person in a thousand years to get it right and to really understand the gospel? Wasn't it more likely, Martin, that you're mistaken and have utterly missed the point of Christianity rather than the whole church for whom Jesus had promised to send the Holy Spirit to guide into all truth? That's a good question. <laughs> you can see why Martin would go, wow. Martin asked for time. Give me time to consider my response to this. So they gave him a night. And Martin went home that night to, his, to where he was staying there in Worms, to his room, and he wrestled all night with two things. One, this question that was placed in front of him. And second of all, this one, am I the only one that's wise? You see the sincerity of his heart there. <laughs> this question got to him. And he had to ask himself, God, am I the only one that's wise? And Martin wrestled through the night, and the next day he came back to uh, present himself. But this time, the crowds had grown and had grown and had gotten so big, and there were so many people that came that they had to move uh, the building in which they met. And now as Luther stood before all the cardinals and before all the dignitaries and the princes and uh, the emperor, this was his response. Since then, your serene majesty and your lordship seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner. Neither horned nor toothed. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. May God help me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Guys, that's an amazing moment in church history. To be honest with you, I read this to my wife yesterday. I actually got emotional, and you guys know how emotional I am. But you know, you got to stop and think. It's kind of like if I call one of you up in front of this church and say, hey, listen, are you telling me what you're trying to say that every other church, not only in America, but the world is wrong? Every other church, you know, the church for 500 years has all been wrong. You're saying you're the only one that's got it right. That's big. And uh, because of Martin Luther's stance, everything we experience today in church is different because of that moment. And as a result of that stance of Martin Luther, he was declared a heretic which meant that he was open game for anybody to kill without any consequences. And so on Martin's trip back from Worms to Wittenberg, he was kidnapped by a group of men. You think, okay, here's the end. But actually it was a group of friends, Frederick the Wise, uh, the one who was in charge of the district where uh, Martin actually lived in Wittenberg, uh, actually agreed with what Martin was teaching. And so he wanted to protect Martin. And so they kidnapped him on the way back and they took him to Wartburg Castle and he stayed there for 10 months. And during that time that he was at the castle, he wrote books, he wrote pamphlets, but the most important thing that he did was the fact that he had such a heart to get the word of God into the hands of common people that just in 11 weeks, imagine the amount of work this took, in 11 weeks, Martin Luther translated the Bible from the Greek text into the common language of the people in Germany so that they could have the Bible in their own language. 
Martin himself said, as you read his table talks, which are his discussions he had with students in his home years later, and he wrote, so these are his own words. He said, the battle with Satan was so intense during that time that he was assaulted with doubts, with depression, with confusions, with insomnia, and again with that question, am I alone wise? And Luther believed when he translated the Bible that he was fighting the devil with ink. A lot of people believe that he kind of threw an ink well against the wall uh, trying to fight the devil. It appears as you read his writings later, what he meant by that is he fought the devil with ink by making the word of God available to people in print. Because he translated it and wrote it out. Satan's attack against the word of God is something that not only Martin Luther knew, but if you remember all the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter one, when God spoke to Adam and then he was in the garden and speaking to Eve, what he did with God's word, what did he do? He twisted God's word. He added to God's word. He tried to create doubt regarding God's word. Everything in his attack against Adam and Eve centered upon the word of God. Thousands of years later, we find ourselves in the wilderness with Jesus and what was Satan doing? Satan was taking the word of God out of context. He was misapplying the word of God, seeking to get Jesus to trip up. And yet here we learn another valuable lesson. How did Jesus defeat the devil? It's with the word of God. Guys, we have no idea how big this is. Satan has a better idea of it than we do <laughs> because Satan will attack every effort to proclaim, to read, to study, to memorize, to meditate, to obey, to believe this book. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's the passage that is so foundational to this whole truth of sola scriptura. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to tell you what, actually as we look at this passage, we're going to see we have something bigger than the diet of worms when we read this passage going on. Let me give you the context. Paul was writing to Timothy, a young pastor, companion of his. In many ways, Paul was like a father in the faith. I don't think he brought Timothy to Christ, but he certainly mentored him along the way. And what he was writing, he said, you know, Timothy, difficult times are going to come. And they're going to come because of ungodly character among men and women, because of immoral living, and finally, because of spiritual deception through false teachers and an appearance of a religion that seems like the real thing but really doesn't have the essence of the power of God in it. And so what he's doing is he's telling Timothy, Timothy, in the midst of this kind of situation, God has given you two compasses to guide your life as you walk through times like this. The first compass was, you know, follow my teachings, my purpose, my conduct. Paul said, you know what? God gave you a mentor. <laughs> I'm your mentor. And you can look at my life and learn how to walk in these kind of times as you follow my life. But the second compass he talks about that God gave him was the word of God. And that's where I want to pick up here in verse, let me start with verse 15. I read it at the start of this message. I'll start in 14. You, however, continue in the things you have learned to become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, New Testament, Old Testament, every verse is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, 
for training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. Inspired means God breathed. If you ever stop and think about when you speak, you speak your breath is what your words are carried on. Sometimes we speak so fast, I gotta stop and catch my breath. And when it says the words are God breathed, that means these words are the very words of God. All the writings, scripture, these written words in the Old and New Testament are the very words of God. And we know that Satan is going to work against them because we know that God's word is powerful. You do remember from Genesis uh, that when God spoke, he created everything that has been created just by speaking it into existence. We know from Romans 1, we saw at the start of this series, the very passage that impacted Martin Luther so big, for it's in the gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. People are saved by the word of God as the spirit of God takes it and opens up their hearts to receive it. And so the very first thing we learn here, he's saying, Timothy, I want you to know that all the scripture is the very words of God. So when you got, and you're in the midst of difficult times and the character of the people around you is out of sorts, the teachings of the church around you are out of sorts, the living of people is out of sorts, and by the way, that wasn't just back then, it sounded like the days we live in. What he's telling Timothy is, you know what, you've got the very words of God. And these words are profitable or they're useful for teaching what's the truth. What am I supposed to believe? How do you operate here? The, 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 these very words of God are profitable for teaching. They're for reproof to say, wait a minute. Whoa, going the wrong way. Let me call you back. For correction. All right, Lord, you're right. I'm going the wrong way. How, how do I get this thing cleaned up? How do I fix it? How do I get back on track? And for training in righteousness, once we're on track, God, how do we stay on track and not fall? And so what Paul is saying to Timothy, these very words from God are useful for these things. And here's the reason in verse 17, so that the man and woman of God may be adequate. That means proficient in the sense of able to meet all the demands. Complete all that you need, all that you need. What do we feel when we feel inadequate? I don't have enough. When you're adequate, you got enough. The word of God is all that we need. That doesn't mean that God doesn't give us other gifts of teachers trying to help us understand it in books and other writings, but this is the source. <laughs> the word of God is adequate. Equipped, that means fully furnished. That means that once I buy that piece of furniture for my house, I don't stop and say, oh, now, okay, I got that room done. Now what can I do for that room? Or what do I need to put on the wall? It says, you know what? Everything's furnished. Nothing else to get. It's complete. God's word is enough. It's all we need. It completely furnishes us for everything that God wants us to do in life, for every good work, for everything we believe, everything we do. The Bible alone is the only and final infallible authority that speaks for God. Listen to how the Amplified says it. So that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. But this is why I say this passage is bigger than the diet of worms. Because look at where he goes in chapter 4. Listen to what he says. And it only makes sense in light of this truth that he would say this. I solemnly charge you. Now we felt the weight of Martin Luther standing before the imperial diet in worms. But now listen to this. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus 
who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearance and by his kingdom. You understand the weight of this? After, after telling us the, the importance and the value and the sola scriptura of God's word, he's telling you, I'm going to charge you right now in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the second coming of Jesus, in the presence of his kingdom, preach the word. Amen. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove with the Word of God, rebuke with the Word of God, exhort with the Word of God, with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy, but you, brothers and sisters at Moraine Valley, be sober in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let me close with one more fact about the Reformation. Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, John Huss, John Calvin, Zwingli, all these guys, you know what? These guys were the key. They were the spark that God used to begin the fire of the Reformation. But you want to know when the Reformation turned into a wildfire? It's when Martin Luther got the word of God into the language of the people and got it in the hands of the people. And when the people started reading the book and saying, wait a minute, what I've been learning from the church is not consistent with what I'm reading in this book. Wait a minute, all these other practices and ceremonials and rituals that they're saying about are additions to what this book says. And what happened is, is the Reformation went wide and deep because the Word of God got into the hands of the common people. And when they looked at the Word of God and they looked at their lives and they looked at the church and they looked at what they were learning, they saw a difference between them and God radically moved through the common people getting the word in their hands and them taking it to others. So let me tell you this. The last thing Satan wants today is for the book to get in the hands of your kids. These kids got a lifetime ahead of them, man. You know, I'm, I'm on the other end of the candle, kind of shorter. They got these big candlesticks. A lot of time, parents, may God give you grace to invest God's word into the heart of these kids. The last thing Satan wanted was that Bible in the hands of your kids this morning. And the last thing he wants is it in our hands. And if he can't keep from getting it in our hands, he's going to do everything he can to keep us from reading it. Whether it's filling our schedule with all kinds of stuff or staying up late with this or that, the last thing Satan wants for people who have the Bible in their hands is to actually open it up and read it. And if Satan can't keep us from getting up in the morning or at the end of the day, or at lunchtime or break time from opening this book and reading it, what he is going to do when I try to read, he's going to do everything he can to get me to distract me so that I'm really just reading words, but not my heart and my mind is full of other things. And if Satan can't keep me from getting this book and reading it and being distracted, but I read this book, then he's going to work to get me to doubt it so I won't believe what it says. And if he can't keep me from doubting it, he's going to work at keeping me from telling other people about the truths of God's wonderful love and grace that are revealed in this book so that another reformation can't begin from the people of Moraine Valley Church who take the word of God as their only and final authority. Father, may you make that so here at Moraine Valley. God, would you move in us in such a way? God, would we have a new respect for this holy book in front? It's called holy because it means there's no other like it. It's a one-of-a-kind book. It's supernatural. It's the only book where God is the author. And God, I pray that you would write upon our hearts the truths of today. 
God, I pray the new covenant says the Spirit will write on our hearts. I pray that this truth, you would write so deeply upon our hearts, Lord, that it would drive our lives and drive our church and that we might become people through whom another reformation may begin today to the glory of Jesus. It's in his name I pray.